Hello, everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us again this week. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come again to ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government that is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church and so we are reading excerpts from the seventh chapter of romans so we're reading verse 7, 12, 14, and 22. And the excerpt is to arouse your curiosity to read the entire chapter. So all of the verses will come from the NIV unless otherwise stated. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Then verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And finally, verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. So in previous lessons, I have made uh, several feeble attempts to get Paul's message across. And if you need a refresher, go back through the lessons on this YouTube channel to review them. One of the great things about uh, YouTube is that whatever is there is there permanently so years from now you can pull it up in some kind of way and view it the mechanism to get there might change but the stuff that is there will always be there so i said all that to say that you can go back anytime and look at a lesson if you miss one or if you just want to hear it over again it's there, so you can go back. At least that's my understanding, that it'll be there forever, just waiting on you to, to decide to listen. So, but Paul, uh, Paul himself makes a profound statement in the second, seventh chapter uh, to drive his, home, his point home. To me, every single verse is building on the next verse. Uh, Paul is hammering in a point. And, and verse 12 uh, sums up how we are to view the law. He says, so then, meaning in view of what has already been stated about the law, he has concluded that the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Then, it, it's as if he knows how we think. Paul asks the question, and he answers. Uh, he, he asks and he answers the rhetorical question that would be on the reader's mind. He, he says in verse 13, Did that which is good then become death to me? And then he answers and says, by no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly 
sinful. So, so Paul is saying to show sin for what it really is, the law, which is holy, and the commandment of the law, which is holy, righteous, and good, it was given to show that, that the law and the commandment is good. But it shows the sin in us. When I was a young child, uh, we didn't have central heat. Uh, I'm probably aging myself, but we didn't have central heat. Uh, I was probably around 11 or 12 or so when we got it. So, but up until then, we used space heaters that were attached to gas lines. And so my parents gave us the do's and the don'ts for how to to coexist with the heaters. And, and, and then the heaters had these little guardrails around them to prevent us from getting too close to the fire. And so the fire was good, but it, it could awaken a curiosity inside an inquisitive child. And as a result, the fire that was good could become deadly. Now, just because the fire could cause death did not make the fire bad. The fire was still good and it was still needful. The guardrails would often be hot enough to convince most folk that the fire was utterly hot and should be avoided. That, that's Paul's point about the law, that just because the law points out sin does not make the law bad. The law, even though it points out sin, which can be utterly deadly, the law is still holy, righteous, and good. And, and then Paul hammers his point again in verse 14. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. He, he says in that verse, we know three things. First, we know that the law is spiritual. Second, we know that I am not spiritual. I am unspiritual. And third, we know that I am, meaning all of us, are sold as a slave to sin. So the first point is that the law is good and the law is of God. But I am of flesh. I'm carnal. Uh, uh, I'm of my flesh. My natural desire is for fleshly things. No matter how we try to suppress the flesh, given the right circumstances, it will rise up. The flesh cannot successfully suppress itself. The, that, that is why we see, we have seen, and we see some pillars of the Christian world succumb to, to what we see as common sin. And, and when they fall, it's a big fall and, and is heard by thousands. It affects thousands. So, Depending on the flesh to suppress the flesh is, is like putting the fox in charge of, the, uh, of protecting the chicken coop. The nature of the fox will win out every time and he will devour the chicken every time. So third, Paul says that I am sold as a slave to sin. Then Peter can chime in. And, and, and Peter says in the last part of 2 Peter, uh, the second chapter, verse 19, he says, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. Whatever takes control of us, whatever has mastered us, we become slaves to it. Uh, here's a comical, it, it, it's comical, but it's a true confession of, of a mind uh, or a situation in my own life. 
most people that attend our eight o'clock Bible study at Mount Sinai have heard my, I guess you can call it testimony, that at one time I was addicted to M&Ms. Yeah, you heard me right. M&Ms, the candy. And, and, and not just the plain ones, but the ones with the peanuts. And even though it was funny to most folk, it was a real struggle for me. And, and But this is how sin works. Before I confess my struggle, nobody ever just brought me some M&Ms. But afterwards, after I confessed my, my struggle with M&Ms, uh, sin made sure that there was always some M&Ms available. Somehow, some they would show up. At a, at, at, and they would show up at a time when I thought I had the addiction somewhat under control. But somebody who, who it, it was always somebody who really meant well and, and somebody who had good intentions would buy M&Ms just for me. It, it's as though those M&Ms were saying, you are mine. I own you. You can't resist me. And, and for a long time, that was true. They had me under their control. They mastered me. And, and no matter how I said, I would not. I eventually did. And, and so Paul hammers home this point in verse 15 and 16, which we've covered in previous lessons. Paul says, I'm doing the stuff that I really, show sure enough, ain't playing, don't want to do. Which means that I agree that the law, I agree with the law that says don't do it. And I agree that it's, it, it is bad and I shouldn't do it. If I'm beating myself up over doing it, then I agree that I shouldn't do it, which means I agree with the law. And the fact that I want to do what is right, but I keep on doing what is wrong, that is a sure sign of, uh, that, that sin that is living in me and that it is controlling me. If I'm doing what I don't want to do, then something is controlling me. Something is making me do it. And that something is sin. Now, those of you who are breathing a sigh of relief and thinking that sin made me do it, I can't hold me responsible. Sin did it. I didn't do it. And, and so therefore, I get off the hook. Well, no, be so quick. There's more. Paul says, based on my struggles, my inability to do what I know is the thing to do, in verse 21, he again makes a so then type statement to hammer in a point. He says, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil, is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Paul says, the struggle is real. The struggle is 24-7. 365 days and every four years we get an additional day making it 366 days. He says the struggle is real and if that's not bad enough it's an inside job. It goes with me wherever I go. I can't shake it. I can't throw it off. I can't run off and leave it. I can't hide from it. It's with me wherever I go. 
Now you got to remember that Paul is talking to the Christian church in Rome that consisted of both Jews and Gentiles. So he's saying that as a Christian redeemed by grace, there is something within him, something within me, something within you as Christian that wants to do good, that agrees with the law, but there's also something else in me. I'll just get personal. There is also something else in me, something else in you that rises up when I want to do right and it says, no, I'm not having it. Even though I determine not to eat the M&Ms with the peanuts, I'm determined not to do what is bad. I suddenly find myself in the right circumstance that causes my resolve to melt away. And, and, I, I, and then what happens after I yield, then I start to justify the very thing I have determined to be bad. And I end up doing what I swore I would not do. Paul says, there's two forces within me. There's the me that want to do God's will. And there's the sin that lives in me, which is against everything God. The redeemed me always wants to do God's will. And then there is that beast called sin that is also lying there. Although it has been kicked down, it, it still rises, it, it is still able to rise up. And it knows the law. It is aware of the do's and the don'ts. And when the opportunity arises, which is every time I want to do good, it rises up and springs to life and causes me to do what I said I wouldn't do. Willpower is not enough to fight sin. Trying to fight sin with willpower, sin will win every time. Knowing what to do and swearing not to do it is easy when the temptation is not present. But when the temptation and the circumstances or the opportunities come together, all my determination, all your determination melts away. And we do not do what is right. We do exactly what we did not want to do. And the next step afterwards is to beat ourselves up. We, we beat ourselves up and, and, and we say stuff like, what is the matter with me? Why do I keep doing that? Why can't I not do that? And, and then, as if we just didn't do it, we'll resolve, I'm not going to do it again. And then the cycle starts all over again. That is where most of us live. That is where we are most of the time, if we will be honest. One of those deep inner groans that, that is the struggle that we all have constantly going into circles, saying I'm not gonna, and then I do, then I beat myself up, then I say I'm not gonna, and it just keeps on starting or, or it keeps going over and over. Paul puts it like this. In verse 24, he says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Think about that. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Think about that until we meet next time. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Bye-bye.